Hi everyone, welcome back. I am so happy to be here because there was a part of me that didn't know if I was gonna be able to get a video off this week, but we are here. And I just wanna say thank you so much for being so understanding last week. I hated letting you all down. I felt so guilty, but last week was just one of those weeks for me where everything went wrong. I felt like the universe was against me. And then I thought I had COVID, which thank God I didn't. But I just wanna thank you guys so much for being the best people in the world. I am so happy to be here today. So today we have an absolutely incredible survivor story and the events of today's case will literally, and I mean literally, shock you to the core. We are going to be talking about the survival story of Mary Vincent and oh my god this woman, she is so so strong. I honestly cannot believe what she went through. Mary Vincent was just 15 years old when her whole world got turned upside down forever. And this all happened when Mary hitched a ride from the wrong person. Yes, this is a hitchhiking story. Oh. Remember the case of Colleen Stan? Um, if you haven't watched that video, you should. Well, that was another case where hitchhiking went terribly wrong. And what is just really strange about today's case is that it did take place in a very similar area in California as the Colleen Stan case. And it also happened in a very similar time period, which is just very, very strange. So the evil perpetrator in today's case, oh my God, this man, makes my blood boil. And this man is called Lawrence Singleton. There are not enough evil words in the dictionary to describe this man. This man is pure evil. He is a monster. What he did to Mary Vincent is the stuff of nightmares. Even though Mary Vincent is the most well-known victim of Lawrence Singleton, there is actually another victim in this story that doesn't get spoken about as much. This case is another one of those cases that just seems too far-fetched to be real. It just seems like a movie, but it's not. It's real life. So that is what we're going to get into today. So yeah, prepare yourselves for this one because it, it's a lot. So I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is HelloFresh. Now you guys know how much I already love HelloFresh. I have like three to four meals a week from HelloFresh at this point. I literally don't know what I would do without HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get delicious recipes with fresh ingredients delivered straight to your door and it literally just takes out the stress of planning what to have for dinner. And one thing that I absolutely love about HelloFresh is how flexible it is. Like some weeks I know that I'm going to be eating out a couple of times or maybe I have something planned, I'm going to be out and I don't need as many HelloFresh meals that week. And it's just so easy to go in and make changes. Some weeks I only have two HelloFresh meals delivered and then some weeks I have five. You can even change your delivery day. Like my delivery day is every single Monday, which I've got to say I do look forward to Mondays. I look forward to when my HelloFresh box arrives and I love unpacking it. But last week, but this week, but last week I knew that I wasn't going to be in on Monday. So I changed my delivery day to Tuesday. And again, that is just something so easy. HelloFresh is just so flexible. You can change your delivery day. You can change how many meals you have each week. Plus the food is incredible. The recipes each week, I love picking out what meals I'm gonna have. They're all so delicious. I've never been disappointed with a HelloFresh meal. So you always get a really nice home cooked meal. There is less prep when it comes to HelloFresh, which means less stress. There is also less food waste because HelloFresh always deliver the correct amount of ingredients. And if you guys, wanted to try out HelloFresh for yourself, go to hellofresh.com and use the code Danielle16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Again, go to hellofresh.com and use the code Danielle16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Thank you again to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video, but thank you to every single one of you watching right now because without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. Lauren Singleton was born on the 28th of July, 1927, making him a Leo. He was born in Tampa, Florida, where he had a lot of siblings. And I actually don't know the exact number. Some sources said six, some sources said seven. So a lot of siblings. And not much is actually known about Lawrence's background, which is just really, really frustrating because I would love to know what the hell happened in this man's life to make him so evil and into the monster that he becomes. But what we do know about his background is that after he left school, he did serve in the military in Korea in a very gruesome war zone. But then for the rest of his life and for the majority of his life, he actually was a merchant marine where he would basically work on cargo ships and travel the world. And he used to work below deck operating all of the machinery. Lawrence did get married twice. And I don't know any of the details about these marriages, which is why I just 
say he was married twice, but we do know that Lawrence was a raging, violent alcoholic. He really struggled to control his emotions. He suffered with really low moods. He did suffer with depression on and off, and he also was very violent, very angry as well, especially when he was drunk. So I don't know anything about the marriages, but they did break down relatively quickly. And I think we can safely assume that maybe it was because Lawrence was a dick. I'm sorry, I'm gonna be sassy in this video because seriously, Lawrence is disgusting. And then by the time Lawrence gets to his 50s, he leaves his job as a merchant marine and settles down in Sparks, Nevada. And he moved here to live out his retirement on his own. We also do know that Lawrence had a daughter from his first marriage, but the relationship with his daughter was not a good one. His daughter did not like him and I wonder why. Like I have said, Lawrence was a raging, violent drunk. And one time when he was drunk, he lashed out at his daughter and slapped her really hard. His daughter was just like, yeah, I'm not putting up with this. Like, I don't want anything to do with you. And after this incident, she actually filed a complaint against her father, Lawrence, and she asked to be removed from his custody. And I think it was granted. And then from that moment on, they were estranged. They didn't really have that much of a relationship. And honestly, her getting away from her father was probably the best decision she has ever made. And that is pretty much all we know about Lawrence's background until we get to 1978 when Lawrence is 51 years old. And this is when he meets his first victim, 15 year old Mary Vincent. Mary was born in 1963. She was one of seven children and she lived with her parents and her other siblings in Las Vegas. Now, Mary was described as a very happy, bright child. She had a really good future ahead of her. She was a really competitive, talented dancer, and that was her dream to become a dancer. And her instructors were confident that she would become a dancer. Like she was really, really talented. However, in the summer of 1978, things took a turn for the worst for Mary. It's said that her parents went through a pretty messy divorce and this kind of screwed her over. It kind of put her on a bad path. And Mary decided to run away from home. Things were that bad in the household. And this wasn't just like, oh, I'll run away for a few hours, teach my parents a lesson, and then I'll come back home. Oh no, no, Mary used to be gone for days, if not weeks at a time. And Mary spent time living on the streets. She would sleep anywhere she could. Sometimes that would be in unlocked cars. And this is when she met and spent some time with a 26 year old companion, Diego Montoya. I saw some sources even called Diego her boyfriend. I was just like, uh uh, no, would not. Even if Mary was voluntarily with him. I'm sorry, we all know what Diego is. He is 26 years old. What does he want with a 15 year old that is living on the street and is vulnerable? Hmm, yeah. And when Mary was with Diego, kind of like living with him rough on the streets, I don't really know where they were. Diego was actually arrested for raping another 15 year old girl. So I think it's safe to say that Diego is not a good person, not somebody that Mary should be hanging around with, but obviously she's desperate. She's doing whatever she can to survive right now. She's living on the streets. So now that her companion Diego is gone, Mary really doesn't know what to do because she relied on Diego a lot to help her out, to get her somewhere to sleep, get her food, etc. And she was really lost without him. So this is when Mary decided to hitchhike to stay for a little bit with her grandfather down in LA. And yeah, hitchhiking, wow. Oh God, I'm glad it's not really a thing anymore. I mean, at least I don't think it's a thing anymore, but it's currently the 70s and hitchhiking was huge. Pretty much everyone did it. And when Mary decided to hitchhike, this is when she had the unfortunate experience of meeting Lawrence Singleton, which is obviously the evil monster of today's case. So the date is the 29th of September, 1978. Now Mary had a long way to go. She had quite a long way to hitchhike and her journey started off really well. She managed to hitch a ride with a couple of different people and everything goes great because most of the time hitchhiking back in the 70s was fine. Most of the time people did 
pick other people up off the side of the streets with good intentions. However, people like Lawrence Singleton used to use that to their advantage. So Mary managed to hitch a couple of rides with a couple of different people and she made it all the way to Berkeley in California. And Berkeley is a college town, a lot of young people obviously, and a lot of hitchhikers as well. And where Mary was dropped off by the previous hitchhikers, it was actually called Hitchhiker's Corner. So it's not like Mary is stood on a deserted road in the middle of the desert with her thumb out trying to get a ride. She is in a very populated area she is stood with a lot of other hitchhikers so mary is stood at hitchhikers corner with a couple of other hitchhikers that are also heading south in the same direction as her and this is when lawrence singleton pulls up in his van so when lawrence pulls up next to mary mary takes one look at him and she's like great he looks like a grandfather. He just looks like an older man. He looks friendly. He has a nice smile. On first impressions, Mary didn't get any kind of creepy vibes from him. She just saw him as a grandfather. And Lawrence says to Mary, I'm also heading south so I can give you a ride. And Mary's thinking, great, perfect, I'm gonna get in. So Mary goes to climb into the van and the other hitchhikers that are standing with Mary that are also heading in the same direction go to get in the van as well. And Lawrence says, oh no, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm only taking Mary. I don't want any other hitchhikers in my van. I don't have room. And the other hitchhikers are looking at him and are like, you have a van. You have a van that is empty. Why do you only want to give this 15 year old girl a ride and not everybody else? And Lawrence was very insistent that he would only take one hitchhiker and that hitchhiker had to be Mary. Now immediately this set alarm bells off in the other hitchhiker's mind. They were thinking, okay, this is not right. This is creepy. Like, why does he only want this 15 year old girl? He clearly doesn't have the best intentions, but Mary is only 15. She's very naive. And so far she's never had a bad experience hitchhiking, but Mary is also desperate to get off the streets. She can't bear the thought of spending another night on the streets. She just wants to get to her own grandfather in LA. So Mary climbs into the van and the other hitchhikers that are standing with her are trying to warn her. They say to her, don't get in that van. This is creepy. He doesn't have the best intentions. But Mary, like I said, was very naive and she climbed into Lawrence's van. Mary saw Lawrence as this older man and he seemed completely harmless. And Mary thought to herself, well, what's the worst that could happen? And unfortunately, this would be a decision that she would regret for the rest of her life. So Mary is now in Lawrence's van completely alone and they set off towards LA. They are currently heading south. And at first, everything seemed great. Mary's mind, any kind of doubts that she did have from the other hitchhikers went out of her mind. They were having a bit of small talk. Lawrence was telling Mary that he also had a daughter of a similar age. This information as well, that Lawrence had a daughter, also reassured Mary that, oh, he's not going to hurt me. He has a daughter that's a similar age. I probably remind him of his daughter. So they carry on driving, carry on having a little bit of small talk. At some point in the journey, Mary pulls out a cigarette and pulls a drag. However, at the same time, she sneezes. And in response to this, which honestly gives me the creeps, Lawrence reached out and stroked her neck just really gives me the creeps and it gave Mary the creeps as well she instantly pulled away and as soon as Mary pulled away Lawrence did remove his hand straight away so Mary in her mind was just thinking okay he's a little bit weird that was a little bit creepy but at least he pulled his hand away straight away she thought to herself oh maybe he's just a bit touchy-feely maybe he's just a bit eccentric so Mary shakes off this little bit of a creepy moment she puts it to the back of her mind she probably doesn't want to think about it because right now she's alone in a van with this man so she probably doesn't really want to think about the fact that he is a creep so she puts it to the back of her mind and then at some point after that extremely creepy moment she does fall asleep and then a short while later when she wakes up from her nap she immediately knows something is wrong because they are heading in the wrong direction 
They are supposed to be heading south towards LA, but they're actually heading east towards Nevada. And Mary starts to think back at all of the little creepy things that have happened so far. She starts to think back about the fact that Lawrence didn't want any other hitchhikers in his van, even though he has room. The fact that Lawrence was adamant that it was only Mary that was allowed, none of the other hitchhikers, only Mary. And then the fact that he stroked her neck after she sneezed, and now they're heading in the wrong direction. Mary was thinking, okay, no, there is too many things now that have happened. This is all adding up. This is super weird. He is creepy. And she started to panic. She thought, okay, I'm in a very bad situation here. I need to get out of it. So she reached under her seat to look for anything that she could use as a weapon if she needed to. And she actually got her hands on this really long metal it was like a measuring stick. I don't really know what that's supposed to look like, but just like a long metal object essentially. And she pulled it up from under the seat and she started waving it at Lawrence. And she was saying, you're going the wrong way. You were supposed to be heading south towards LA. Why are you heading east towards Nevada? Turn around, turn this van around. And at this point, you probably would think that Lawrence would lash out at Mary because of this, become violent or either just ignore her. But he responds in a very weird way. He starts acting kind of like a blithering idiot essentially. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm an old man. I get confused very easily. It was an innocent mistake. I'm really sorry. I'll turn the van around and we'll head in the right direction. And Mary was like, okay, good. I dealt with that. I showed him. He's scared of me now. And Lawrence instantly turns the van around and they start heading back in the right direction, which was south. And Mary is instantly calm again. She is at ease. She thinks, okay, we're heading in the right direction now. Let's relax. Everything is going to go great. So they are driving for a little bit in the right direction. And they are now on a completely long deserted road and I mean there is no one around there's barely any passing traffic they are literally in the middle of nowhere and we all know that this is not going to end well because there is no one around right now so at some point when they're driving along this really long deserted road Lawrence puts his foot on the brake very suddenly and he turns to Mary and says I've got to take a leak so Lawrence climbs out of the van and he goes to the bathroom and Mary gets out of the van as well to stretch her legs and she looks around, realizes, okay, this is a very deserted road. There's no one around right now. She's definitely getting creepy vibes. I mean, she's obviously getting creepy vibes from Lawrence, but just her surroundings, it's very creepy. It's also nighttime as well, which makes everything a lot creepier. And Mary starts to get that gut feeling that something's not right, that something is going to happen. She's feeling really uneasy. And all of a sudden, Mary feels really exposed. She feels very vulnerable on this deserted road at night with this creepy man. And she gets that impulsive thought in her head and she thinks to herself, what if he attacks me? So she starts to analyze the situation. She lets that thought grow. And she looks at Lawrence and she thinks, okay, He's old. He doesn't look that healthy. I'm young. I'm fit. I'm healthier than he is. I could definitely outrun him. And she looks down at the shoes that she is wearing and she's wearing trainers, which are obviously good for running in. But there is one problem and that is that her shoelaces are untied. So she thinks to herself, well, okay, if I'm going to run, my shoelaces need to be tied. So Mary bends down to tie her shoelaces. Unfortunately, things escalate and take a very sudden tragic turn. Because in that exact moment when Mary bends down to tie her shoelaces, Lawrence has creeped up behind her and smashes her over the head with a sledgehammer, which when I read that for the first time, I was like, oh my God, a sledgehammer. And when I say he smashed her over the head with a sledgehammer, I mean, he used all of the strength in his body to smash Mary over the head with a sledgehammer. He wanted to make sure that she was unconscious because he definitely did not need to use that amount of force. So after being smashed over the head with the sledgehammer, Mary immediately lost consciousness. And when she came round a short while later, Lawrence was standing over her. But unfortunately being smashed 
over the head with a sledgehammer was just the beginning. It was about to get so much worse. The first thing that Lawrence did when Mary came round was grab her hair and shove his penis in her mouth. And then shortly after he forced Mary to perform oral sex on him, he then grabbed her, dragged her to the back of the van, he tied her up. And then throughout the remainder of the night, Lawrence went on and raped Mary six times times which is just absolutely horrifying and Mary was conscious the whole attack she was aware of what was going on she was fully awake she was looking at Lawrence doing this to her and this went on throughout the whole night and Mary she has said after the attack that she was thinking oh my god this is the worst thing I have ever ever been through I hope he kills me. I want to die. That is how bad this attack was. Mary was wishing that Lawrence would kill her. Throughout the attack, Mary was forced to drink a substance, which she assumes was alcohol or some kind of mixture of alcohol. She's not sure. And I think Lawrence was just giving her this alcoholic beverage to subdue her, to calm her down, to make her easier to attack essentially. But it didn't. Like I said, Mary was conscious throughout the whole attack. She was screaming through the whole thing. She was pleading with Lawrence to stop. She was pleading with him to let her go, set her free. She was saying to Lawrence, please let me free. I won't tell anyone. Just please let me go. Set me free. But Lawrence just ignored her and the brutal rapes carried on until the sun came up the next day. And it's just truly heartbreaking what Mary has gone through up until this moment, but we still have unfortunately a lot more to come. So the sun had risen, like I said, it was the next day and Lawrence dragged Mary from the back of the van and dragged her into the open on this deserted desert road. There was still no one around. They were literally in the middle of nowhere. I'm not being dramatic there. There was nobody around. Lawrence could literally do what he wanted. He probably purposely went to this road knowing that no one was going to disturb him. Lawrence threw Mary onto the ground and she was completely beaten and bruised. She was bleeding. And Mary was still pleading with Lawrence to let her free, set her free, let her go. And I've got to warn you all now, the next thing that happens is probably one of the most horrifying and traumatic things I have ever heard happen to anyone. Because this is when Lawrence said to Mary, you want to be set free? I'll set you free. This is when Lawrence went to the back of his van and pulled out a small axe from his toolbox. He walks back to Mary, grabs her left arm and swings the axe down on her forearm just below her elbow. This happened very, very quickly and Mary didn't quite know what was going on and she felt herself starting to fall back which really confused her because she was actually grabbing onto Lawrence and she was thinking, why the hell am I falling backwards? I'm grabbing onto this man. But Mary continued to fall backwards to the ground, but she felt she was still grabbing onto Lawrence. And in that exact moment, she looked down at her left arm and realized that he had cut her arm off. In that one swing of his ax, he had completely chopped her arm off clean. I know, I know, what the actual hell? Why did Lawrence just go to the back of his van, grab an ax and cut her arm off? What possessed him to do that? Why did he do that? How have we gone from him brutally raping her in the back of a van to now chopping off her arm? So Mary was now back on the ground, lying there, writhing in the most unimaginable pain. And she could feel everything. She didn't lose consciousness or anything, which I would have expected her to kind of black out or something from the pain, from just something. But she was aware of everything. She could feel the pain. She could feel the blood oozing out of her. She could feel the hot liquid on her. And she remembers the burning. It burned so badly. The sharp pain. But was Lawrence done? No. Of course he wasn't. Because in that moment when Mary is lying on the ground, Lawrence grabs her right arm. And again, he brought the axe down onto her right arm. Lawrence had to bring the axe down three times onto Mary's right arm, but the effect was still the same. 
Lawrence had now chopped off Mary's right arm. And again, I think we just need to pause what the hell. Lawrence has just cut off Mary's arms, both arms just below the elbow. I have never ever seen a case where there has been such a drastic escalation. We have obviously covered cases where torture has been involved. We have covered cases that have equally as disturbing things as what has just happened to Mary. But I have never, ever, ever, ever come across a case where there has been that kind of escalation. There was no gradual buildup to the arm chopping, for example. He just did it. And oh my god, the pure nightmare that Mary is in right now. Again, Mary was conscious through Lawrence cutting off her right arm. She was conscious through the whole thing. She was awake. She was feeling everything. None of us can even, even try to put ourselves in her shoes, in how much pain she was in psychologically, physically. And this is why I say Lawrence is pure evil, pure evil. He is a monster. There is no other way to describe this man. And I honestly don't know how she is still conscious. Like, I don't, I, I don't know. How has she not blacked out from the pain? How has she not blacked out from blood loss? But what is even crazier is that when Lawrence had chopped off Mary's right arm, Mary was lying there on the ground and she looked up at Lawrence and she could actually see her severed arm, her severed right arm still gripping onto Lawrence. I can't even imagine how that would have felt for Mary seeing her severed arm still attached to her attacker. Just before Lawrence had chopped off her right arm, Mary had grabbed onto Lawrence's arm and she must have grabbed on with so much force that when the arm was chopped off, it was still attached, like the muscles had frozen into place. I don't quite know how that works. I don't have any medical background or anything like that, but I assume that that is how it happened. And her arm was literally stuck to Lawrence and she could see Lawrence wriggling around the desert trying to flick her arm off him. It's just unbelievable. I can't believe I'm actually saying this. I can't believe this is real and this actually happened to someone. And Lawrence did eventually flick Mary's arm off and he was still not done. Of course he wasn't. He then walked over to Mary and he grabbed grabbed her and dragged her to a nearby ravine. And this is when Lawrence took Mary's body and threw her off a 30 foot cliff. I know, where does this attack end? What the hell? But even still, he was not done. Lawrence carefully made his way down this 30 foot cliff to Mary's body lying at the bottom. And then he thought to himself, I need to make sure that her body is completely concealed. No one will be able to find her and I can get away with this. So he picked up Mary's body and shoved her body into a concrete pipe. He then thought to himself, okay, her body is hidden well enough now. She's going to bleed out from her injuries and no one would be able to find her. He then carefully made his way back up the cliff, got into his van and drove off and left Mary's body in that concrete pipe. How can someone inflict so much pain on another person? And I just don't know what the hell was going through Lawrence's head when he was doing this. Did he have this plan in mind from the very beginning? I mean, we don't know. I'm just speculating here. I think it's safe to say that he always knew he was going to sexually assault Mary from the moment he picked her up. Did he plan the murder? Did he want to murder her when he picked her up? What was going through his mind? What was his motive and his intention? I feel like I'm leaning towards, yes, he did want to murder her. Because like I said, the escalation was crazy. How do you go from attacking someone in a van to then chopping off their arms and then leaving them to bleed out to death? But we don't know. It's just crazy that Mary is 15 years old and she innocently got into this van with who she thought was a granddad, very friendly older man. How did he then smash her over the head with a sledgehammer, rape her repeatedly through the night, chopped off both of her arms, threw her off a 30 foot cliff, and then shoved her body into a concrete pipe. How did that actually happen to somebody? But it did, it happened to Mary Vincent. And at this point, you're probably thinking, 
How the hell is she still alive? Because in case you've forgotten, this is a survivor story. How is it that after everything that Lawrence has put her through, how is she still alive? I honestly don't know, but she is. She is alive and she is still conscious in this concrete pipe. Mary is strong and Mary was a fighter and somehow, I really don't know how, she was going to survive this. So first of all, as she was lying in this concrete pipe, she was absolutely freezing because night had fallen by now. She was so weak. She was bleeding out. She was losing so much blood. This is when she started to hear a voice in her head because she was so sleepy. All she wanted to do was fall asleep. Sleep. But that voice inside her head told her, do not go to sleep. You have to stay awake. You have to get out of here because that man is going to do this to another person and you have to get out of this concrete pipe and stop him. After everything that Mary has been through, she is thinking about other potential victims. She's not thinking about herself. So with that thought in her mind, she managed to gather the strength to get herself out of that concrete pipe. And then once she was out of that pipe, obviously both of her arms have been chopped off. She is bleeding profusely. And I really don't know how she is so coherent. How is she thinking so logically? But as soon as she gets out of that concrete pipe, she thinks to herself, okay, I need to stop the bleeding of my arms. Otherwise I am gonna bleed out. So she shoved the ends of her arms just below the elbow. She shoved them into the mud that was around her and the blood mixed with the mud. It made this kind of paste formula and she was able to pack on this paste over her wounds to stop the bleeding. And as well as stopping the bleeding, Mary has also said that she needed to do that. She needed to do something to the ends of her arms to stop the muscles from falling out. And amazingly, this mud blood paste that she had made was enough to clot up the wounds and they actually stopped bleeding. And I just cannot get over. How was she able to think of doing that? She's 15 for starters, but after everything she has been through, to be able to think of doing something like that is honestly incredible. So once Mary had stopped the bleeding, now she needed to get up this 30 foot cliff. And we have to remember that this is a pretty steep cliff. I mean, obviously Lawrence was able to get up and down, but Mary has had her arms chopped off. She is now trying to navigate the world for the first time without arms. And she dragged her body up that cliff and it took every ounce of strength in her body and in her mind to get herself up that cliff to the top. And it actually took her all day. It took her all day to get up this 30 foot cliff. And again, I don't know how she did that. How? How did she do that? And then once she was at the top, obviously she was on this completely deserted road, but in the distance, she could hear traffic, just a few passing cars every now and again. And she thought to herself, okay, I need to head in the direction of those cars. I need to get to that road because that is where I will get help. So she followed the sounds of traffic and she walked for miles again. This took her an incredibly long time in the state that she was in, but she finally made it to the side of the road where she heard cars. But it was still a pretty deserted road. There was still not that much passing traffic. So now Mary is stood at the side of this road, just hoping and praying that a car is going to come by. And all she is thinking to herself is please, please let a car pass because if a car passes, I might be able to survive this. So Mary stood at the side of that road for what must have felt like an eternity, waiting for any car to pass. Now we have to remember that Mary, who is currently stood at the side of this road, is completely battered, bruised. She's covered from head to toe in blood. She now has both arms missing. Whoever is going to come across Mary is in for a very, very shocking sight. And Mary was stood at the side of this road, patiently waiting for anyone to drive past. When all of a sudden she sees a car in the distance and it is a red convertible and Mary is thinking, oh my God, I can't believe a car is coming. They are going to help me and I'm going to survive this. So Mary started frantically waving her arms in the air, trying to flag this car car down trying to get their attention. And as the red convertible approached Mary, they obviously saw her. 
but they just drove past. Which is just so heartbreaking that they didn't stop to help her. I mean, I understand that coming across someone like Mary in the state that she's in, that would be a shock for anyone. But it's quite clear that she needs help, you know? And Mary at a later date has said that she doesn't hold it against the two people that were in that car. She completely understands why they did drive past because she looked like something from a horror film. But thankfully, it wasn't long until another car drove past. This was another convertible that was driving past and there was a couple in the car and they were actually on their honeymoon. So this couple on their honeymoon, they had actually gotten lost. They were never supposed to be on that road that Mary was, but clearly it was fate and thank God they were because they saw Mary and they stopped. They bundled her in the car. They tried to help her as much as they could. They tried to help her wounds and everything and they rushed to the nearest phone that they could because obviously we've got to remember it's in the 70s right now people do not have mobile phones so they had to get Mary in the car they drove to the nearest phone they phoned the emergency services paramedics immediately came out and Mary was actually airlifted to a hospital that would be able to help her injuries and incredibly after everything that Mary had gone through she had actually lost about 50% of the blood in her body and the blood that was remaining in her body had reached a toxic level incredibly Mary survived Survived. It is one of the most incredible survivor stories I think I've ever heard. I honestly can't believe that she survived. She is a fighter. But even though Mary had survived, her ordeal wasn't over yet. I mean, she had suffered significant injuries and her recovery in hospital took a very long time. They had to draft muscle from her legs to reconstruct part of her arm. And then she was also fitted with prosthetic arms with hooks on the end. And amazingly, police, after they discovered all of this, the police found one of Mary's severed arms. They actually found it over a hundred miles from where it was cut off. They found it in San Francisco. It had washed up near the Golden Gate Bridge, which honestly, how? How did they find that? It's just crazy, isn't it, that they found her arm over a hundred miles away from where it was cut off, but obviously they found it too late. There was nothing they could do. So the recovery process that Mary had to go through was absolutely horrendous. She was constantly proving that she was a survivor, that she was a fighter, but her ordeal wasn't over yet because after she had recovered from her injuries, she now had to go through the investigation to help the police catch the person that did this to her. The police wanted to know who did this as soon as they possibly could but initially Mary was too traumatized to even talk to the police she couldn't give any descriptions she was a bit hazy on a few of the details and the police actually used forensic hypnosis to get the full story out of Mary which I think is crazy like how did they do that you don't hear of that happening very often do you and slowly over time bit by bit the details of the story came back to Mary which is honestly so sad that the story was coming back to her and she had to relive it all. I mean, obviously, I'm glad that she was able to give the details to the police because I want Lawrence to be caught, but then I also don't want her to relive it. And Mary was able to give the police a pretty accurate description of Lawrence Singleton. She was able to describe what he looked like and the police put together a composite sketch. And let me tell you, this sketch was accurate. Some of these sketches that they do, yeah, they don't look like anyone. But this sketch of Lawrence Singleton was so accurate that Lawrence's neighbor, once he saw the sketch, thought, oh my God, that is my neighbor, Lawrence, called up the police and said, hey, I know who that person in the sketch is. That is my neighbor, Lawrence Singleton. So from this sketch, because it was so good, the police were able to track down Lawrence. And on the 9th of October, which was two weeks after the attack, Lawrence Singleton was arrested. Mary was then able to identify him from a lineup and he was charged with the attack on Mary. So Lawrence is now arrested, <laughs> but it's not over yet. So initially in the interview, Lawrence denies everything. He's like, no, I don't know what this Mary girl is talking about, but it's all a bunch of lies. I mean, what were we expecting? Were we really expecting him to hold his hands up and go, yeah, it was me, I'm guilty. If only it was that simple. But Lawrence did actually have his own version of events of what happened, which I just wanna point out are complete BS. But this is what Lawrence said. He said that he did pick up Mary in Berkeley, but he didn't just pick up Mary. He also picked up two other hitchhikers. And the other two hitchhikers were two men. One of them was called Pedro and the other one was called Larry. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, he said he picked up a hitchhiker with the same bloody name as him. Now, I'm not sure if Lawrence thinks he's being clever here because obviously Mary has identified her attacker and she has said that a man called Larry attacked her. So I don't know if Lawrence is being clever here and thinking, well, if I say that one of the hitchhikers names was also Larry, maybe the police will think that it was actually that Larry that attacked Mary and not me. So I don't know if he was being really clever, even though it's not that clever, but I don't know if he was being clever or just really stupid. I don't know which one. So Lawrence continues on with his BS story that he picked up Mary, Pedro and Larry. He said that all three of them went to a bar. They had some drinks. They smoked a bit of weed. And then all three of the men, so Lawrence, Larry and Pedro, all three of them paid for sex with Mary because Mary was a quote cheap whore and all of them paid $10 each for sex with her. Lawrence denies raping her because he said it was consensual. He said that he paid for it and he also denied cutting her arms off and said that it must have been Pedro or Larry that did that. Lawrence then said that after all three of the men had sex with Mary, Lawrence then dropped the three of them, Mary, Pedro and Larry off somewhere and when he dropped them off, Mary was completely fine. She wasn't attacked, she wasn't raped and she still had her arms. Meaning that Lawrence is now blaming the attack on this fictitious Pedro or Larry. Thankfully, Lawrence doesn't seem to be the brightest bulb in the box because the police could see straight through this BS. The police were hoping that they were going to be able to get a confession out of Lawrence to just make everything easier. Make him plead guilty, then we won't have a trial and it would just be easier. But no, Lawrence was not going to do that. Instead, the police had to try and collect as much evidence as they possibly could in order to get a conviction. So they searched Lawrence's home and in Lawrence's home, they found a pack of Mary's cigarettes. They also found remnants of burnt clothing that belonged to Mary. Clearly, Lawrence had tried to cover his tracks. The police also found that Lawrence had completely removed the carpet from the back of his van and completely cleaned his van from top to bottom and thoroughly washed everything trying to get rid of the evidence, clearly trying to get rid of all the blood that was in there. The police also learned that just days after the attack on Mary, Lawrence had tried to take his own life, which the police took as a sign of guilt. So after all of the evidence that they had gathered, as well as Mary's testimony, this was enough to take Lawrence Singleton to trial. And this trial took place in March of 1979. And at this trial, Mary had to do one of the hardest things ever, and that was take the stand. She had to take the stand just feet away from Lawrence Singleton. She had to look at her attacker. And to make it even worse, to get to the stand, she had to walk past Lawrence. After she had given her testimony on the stand, she left the stand, she had to walk back past Lawrence. And as she was walking past Lawrence, Lawrence said, quote, if it's the last thing I do, I will finish the job. Which, oh my God, will this man not leave her alone. Has he not done enough? Who the hell does he think he is like literally? And I don't think he was reprimanded in any way for saying that. I don't know if anyone else heard. I assume that they did. But thankfully the jury found Lawrence guilty on all charges, thankfully. And there were a lot of charges. He was convicted of kidnapping, mutilation of a body part, attempted murder, forcible rape, sodomy, and forced oral copulation. So you would think after being convicted of all of those offenses, he would get a very long prison sentence. He would be going away for the rest of his life. He would never be able to get out and hurt anybody else. Well, you would be wrong, unfortunately, because all of those offenses, he was only and I want to stress this, only sentenced to 14 years. How the hell did that happen? How, how, how? But apparently in California at the time, this was the maximum sentence that he could have gotten. The maximum sentence for attempted murder at the time was only 10 years and the maximum sentence for rape was only two. So yes, Lawrence Singleton was only sentenced to 14 years and he was transferred to San Quentin prison to serve his time. And that should have been the end of the video, shouldn't it? I should have said, 
and Lawrence Singleton was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And we should be ending the video, but we are not. Unfortunately, there is one more victim to talk about, but we still have a hell of a lot to get through before we get there. After Lawrence was sentenced to prison, Mary tried to rebuild her life, but it's almost like, how do you rebuild your life after something like that happens to you? What is just so incredibly sad, and it was really sad when I found out this, but Mary's family were completely different towards her after the attack. They didn't know how to look at Mary the same as before now that she was living without arms, which is just honestly so sad. It's like Mary has been through enough. How can her family treat her like that just because she doesn't have arms just because she's been attacked because she's a victim. It's like, oh my God, that is your daughter. That is your sister. And eventually over time, her family just drifted away from her and she became estranged from her family. Mary is also living in constant fear that one day Lawrence Singleton is going to be released from prison. And the years went by and Mary did what she could to live a somewhat normal life. She ended up getting engaged she went on to have two children. However, as her wedding day was approaching, the stress inside her was building up and it wasn't just normal wedding day stress. She was actually getting stressed because the release date of Lawrence Singleton was looming closer and closer. And she just had this really bad feeling in her stomach. She had that gut feeling again. And then on her wedding day, which I cannot believe. Like I've said before, give this woman a break. She found out on her wedding day that Lawrence Singleton was going to be released after only serving eight years. He was being released early due to good behavior. And what are the odds that she found out that news on her wedding day. Apparently at the time, California were really struggling with overcrowding in their prisons. So because of this, they put into place these work incentive schemes, which essentially allowed prisoners to work off their prison sentence. So for every day that they work in prison, they get a day taken off their prison sentence. And Lawrence worked in prison. He was actually a teaching assistant at one point. I think he did a couple of other things, but essentially he was working in prison. And as he was working, working, each day he worked, a day was being taken off his prison sentence, which then allowed him to be released after only eight years. And listen, I understand these schemes. I also understand overcrowding. I understand that if you are suffering with overcrowding, you need to do something. I completely understand that, okay? But I don't care what anybody says, these schemes should not be available to dangerous, violent, prisoners like Lawrence. It's like surely you can do something about your overcrowding without releasing violent, dangerous people. It's like give these schemes to the people that have committed drug offenses or theft or fraud, those kinds of offenses. Don't allow prisoners to participate in these schemes if they've raped and tortured people. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get angry. Like seriously, it just really annoys me. And not only that, Lawrence was also showing no remorse for what he had done, nothing. Throughout his time in prison, he continued to say that Mary had made it up he was actually the victim of Mary's lies. And just before his release, he actually did have a psychological evaluation. And in that evaluation, it said, quote, Lawrence Singleton is so out of touch with his hostility and his anger that he is an elevated threat to others' safety, both inside and outside of the prison. I'm sorry and he was still released. How did he have a psychological evaluation that said all of that and he still got out? It's like overcrowding cannot be that bad that you are being forced to release a man like this. So Lawrence goes ahead and leaves prison. He's given one year parole. And this next bit is actually kind of funny. At least I found it very funny because when Lawrence Singleton left prison, not a single place in California 
wanted him. So the story of Lawrence Singleton and what he had done to Mary Vincent had actually become pretty big news. A lot of people knew about it. And a lot of people knew that he was being released from prison and no one wanted him living in their area. People literally, and I mean literally, came out with their pitchforks to prevent Lawrence living in their area. And this was happening over and over again. So the first town that Lawrence settled in over 400 residents from the local area showed up to protest him and they wanted him out of their area. There was one time as well where he was placed in a hotel just for one night to figure out where he was gonna go and people found out that he was in this hotel and 175 people turned up outside of this hotel in protest. And this was happening over and over again wherever Lawrence went, people were literally showing up and protesting. They did not want him anywhere near them and I completely understand. I mean, would you want Lawrence Singleton to live next door to you? So in the end, because California just didn't know what to do with him, he literally had nowhere to go. They ended up putting Lawrence in a trailer on the grounds of San Quentin prison because nobody wanted him. So he had to basically go back to prison and live in the prison grounds for a year while he was still on parole. And there was so much outrage about Lawrence Singleton and what he had done to Mary and and the fact that he was released early, California actually released new legislation that was called the Singleton Bill. It was even named after him. And this bill prevented prisoners from being released early if their crime included torture. And also the minimum term for a crime involving torture would also be 25 years. But what is just so annoying is that they didn't apply this to Lawrence Singleton himself. I understand that you can't apply law retrospectively. I do understand that, I do, I studied law. But to name a bill after Lawrence Singleton, the Singleton Bill, it's just so frustrating that they couldn't retrospectively apply that bill just to him. I mean, come on, they've named it after him. And I do get why they didn't, but it's just so frustrating. I wish they did because if they had applied that bill retrospectively to him, what goes on to happen would have been prevented. So after Lawrence serves his one year parole in the prison grounds in his trailer, he moves back to Tampa, Florida, which is where he was born in case you've forgotten. And the same thing pretty much happens when he goes back to Tampa no one wants him. So initially he went to live with his brother, but then the house got firebombed by a protester because they found out that Lawrence was there. So he quickly moved out. Someone even offered Lawrence $5,000 to leave the state. Eventually though, he did find a community to settle down in. And I think most of the people in this little town didn't know what he had done. And then those that did know what he had done kind of just accepted it and kind of just thought to themselves, well, he served his time. Everyone deserves a second chance. And I do believe that. I do believe that people deserve second chances, but not someone like Lawrence. So whilst Lawrence is literally playing musical chairs with the towns that he's living in, Mary is trying to rebuild her life, but she is still struggling with that, especially since she's found out that Lawrence is now out. Because don't forget what he said to her at trial. He said that he would finish the job, i.e. he would murder her. And very tragically, Mary's marriage broke down and after her marriage broke down, everything in her life just seemed to fall apart. She got into quite a little bit of debt. She lost so much weight. Her weight fell under 100 pounds. Her health was also really suffering. She could no longer afford the upkeep on her prosthetic arms. And everything just seemed to be going wrong again for Mary. But on top of all of that, <laughs> I cannot believe I'm about to say what I'm about to say but Lawrence Singleton had the nerve to sue Mary Vincent when he got out of prison. Lawrence was now claiming that he was the victim of kidnapping at the hands of Mary, Pedro, and Larry. You literally cannot make this stuff up. It's honestly ridiculous. How does this man have the nerve to sue Mary. Thankfully, the lawsuit didn't get anywhere. I just can't believe he even tried to bring it in the first place. And Mary actually said, you know what? I'm not having this. I'm suing you back. And Mary 
won her lawsuit, she actually won damages of $2.56 million. But unfortunately, Lawrence didn't have any money. He only had $200 in his bank account. So that is all that Mary got, which is so frustrating because if anyone deserves $2.56 million, it's Mary Vincent. And I should also mention that it's not just Mary that is completely terrified now that Lawrence Singleton has been released from prison. Lawrence's own daughter is also terrified because she is so scared scared that Lawrence is going to turn on her and kill her. And his daughter was so scared because when he was in prison, she phoned him up and said, I am officially disowning you. I do not want anything more to do with you. And because of this, now that he was released, she was scared that he was gonna come after her. So as the years pass, Lawrence is living in Tampa, Florida somewhere, and he does get involved in a little bit of crime every now and again. And he actually does go back to prison on theft charges for stealing a three dollar hat from Walmart. It's like seriously why the hell are you stealing a three dollar hat from Walmart? Who needs a hat that badly? Like seriously. So it's now 1997. Lawrence is currently 69 years old and he was described by neighbors at the time as a raging violent alcoholic. He was also rumored to be able to drink two gallons of vodka a day at this point. Lawrence's life had completely fallen apart. He was living a very lonely life and he was suffering suffering a lot with depression. His health was also failing. There was rumors that he did have cancer. And in February of 1997, a neighbor found him trying to commit suicide. The neighbor intervened and actually saved Lawrence's life. But the neighbor has later gone on to say that they regret this. They regret helping him because if they had never discovered Lawrence and Lawrence was actually successful in taking his own life, there wouldn't be another victim in this story, an innocent person wouldn't have lost their life. And this is tragically where we get to the part of the story where we meet Lawrence's last victim, a woman called Roxanne Hayes. Roxanne was 31 years old. She was a mother of three. And Roxanne had a very difficult childhood. She had been sexually abused by her granddad. And this sexual abuse started from the age of two years old. Her father was also an alcoholic and he was a very violent man as well. And he also physically abused Roxanne. And then when Roxanne was 14 years old, her mother died. And it was at the age of 14 that Roxanne decided that she wanted to leave home and leave home for good. So to say that Roxanne had it rough as a child is an understatement. And even after leaving home, things were still really difficult for Roxanne. She became addicted to drugs. She turned to sex work to fund her addiction. This led to Roxanne going in and out of prison on prostitution charges. But despite all of her hardship, Roxanne was still a bright, witty, streetwise person. She just got on with everyone. She was a really caring person. She was a mother of three, like I said, and she did everything for her children. Her children always came first. Every little bit of money that she earned always went to the children first. She wanted to make sure that her children never missed out, that they had everything that they wanted. They had parties at Chuck E. Cheese. They always had really cool little Halloween outfits. And it was on the 19th of February, 1997, just days after Lawrence had tried to take his life, that Lawrence picked up Roxanne in his van for sex work. Roxanne was taken back to Lawrence's home and at around 6 p.m. that night, a neighbor came round to Lawrence's house to discuss some decorating work that he wanted Lawrence to do. However, when he peered inside Lawrence's window, clearly he was knocking on the door and Lawrence wasn't answering. He was about to witness the biggest shock of his life because he saw 69-year-old Lawrence Singleton stood naked over Roxanne and he was beating her and strangling her. Roxanne at this point was still alive and she was screaming for help. The neighbor banged on the window to try and distract Lawrence to try and stop the attack in whatever way he could and Lawrence stopped the attack turned and looked towards his neighbor, stared the neighbor dead in the eye, and then just turned back to Roxanne to finish the attack. Lawrence didn't care that he had an audience. He had tunnel vision of what he wanted to do. So the neighbor dialed 911 and a deputy arrived as quickly as they could, but tragically it was too late. The deputy knocked on the door. Personally, I just feel like they should have kicked down the door, but that's just me. 
Lawrence answered the door. He was completely naked. He was covered in blood. The deputy took one look at him and said, uh, what happened? And Lawrence responded that he cut his finger whilst he was chopping vegetables. You think that cutting your finger whilst chopping vegetables is going to explain how you are covered in blood. The deputy was having none of it, of course, and they stepped inside the house and tragically they found Roxanne's lifeless body on the living room floor. She had been beaten, strangled and stabbed multiple times in the head and torso. Lawrence Singleton was immediately arrested and charged with the murder of Roxanne Hayes. And I literally have no words. Like I have no words. How has he committed another murder oh my god if they had only just given him the appropriate sentence after the attack on mary and obviously there was no denying that lawrence was responsible for this murder i mean there was a witness and lawrence didn't try to deny this murder he actually tried to justify it though he said that roxanne had tried to steal from him and that is why he lashed out and murdered her. Now, I do have a theory on why he killed Roxanne. And I haven't seen this anywhere. This is just my theory. But I think he has been desperate to murder Mary Vinson. I do. I think he has had tunnel vision since the moment he left prison on finishing the job. Remember, he said that to Mary. If it was the last thing that he did, he would finish the job. Well, obviously Lawrence couldn't get to Mary. He didn't know where Mary was. And this is why he decided to take it out on Roxanne. Because if you look at Roxanne, she actually looks very similar to Mary. They both have dark hair, dark eyes. They have a very similar build. They are also of a similar age because Mary would have been in her early thirties at the time of the attack on Roxanne. They are so similar and this is why i think he went after roxanne because she reminded him of mary so that is my theory on why he murdered roxanne because honestly it doesn't make any sense why did he murder roxanne roxanne had done absolutely nothing to him i mean obviously mary had done nothing to him but like why murder roxanne also his approach of the two murders as well because i know he didn't murder mary but he tried to they're completely different. When he tried to murder Mary, he tried to cover it up. He tried to get away with it. He did it on a deserted road where no one would see him. Where with Roxanne, he did it in his own home. He didn't try to cover it up and he admitted to it straight away. Those actions of those two murders are completely different, which is why I think Lawrence was so desperate to murder Mary and obviously he couldn't get to her that he went to the next best thing and he almost didn't care if he got caught. So Lawrence went to trial again for the murder of Roxanne Hayes. And unbelievably, Mary Vincent came out of hiding. Uh -huh, she was in hiding. She came out of hiding to take the stand. She gave her own testimony of her own experience with Lawrence. And with her testimony and witness statements from the neighbor and all of the evidence in the house, Lawrence was found guilty of Roxanne Hayes's murder. And this time, Lawrence was sentenced to death. And then in 2001, whilst he was on death row awaiting execution, Lawrence Singleton died in prison of cancer. And when Mary first heard this news, initially she was not happy. She still didn't have the answers that she felt like she needed. But then she saw the relief on her son's faces when they heard the news that he had died. And this was enough for her. This was all the closure that she needed. Lawrence Singleton could no longer harm her family or her herself and this was good enough for her. Mary then remarried once more and this time she was able to rebuild her life. She became more outgoing. She became more like her old self. She also set up a foundation to help the victims of traumatic crime and this is when she also started to talk about what had happened to her. She was doing interviews talking about her ordeal and what she went through. He replied, you want to be set free? I'll set you free. And he lifted up the hatchet and that's when I I tried fighting him off and was kicking and screaming but I was realizing wait a minute I'm still holding on to his hand but I'm I'm laying on the ground that's when 
I realized that he had chopped off my left arm. She would go around high schools, local theaters. She would speak in front of 200 plus people. People that watch her talk are so inspired by her, by her strength, by her character, her drive. She even learned how to paint and she currently sells her artwork. She truly is an incredible human being. She has so much strength and I am so, so happy that she was able to rebuild her life and she is thriving. So thankfully Mary was able to rebuild her life, but sadly the same cannot be said for Roxanne Hayes. Roxanne Hayes was described as a bright, witty, caring person. She was an incredibly loving mother of three and she would do absolutely anything for her children. Her children were her whole world. She had suffered so much at a young age, but her kids remained the most important thing in the world to her. And I think we must remember that her three children are also a victim in this case because Lawrence Singleton took away their mother. And Roxanne Hayes was only 31 years old. She was so incredibly young. She had so much more to give and Lawrence took her away from her children. So this case is filled with so much heartbreak and also happiness as well that Mary survived and she was able to rebuild her life, but then so much heartbreak for what Mary went through, but then also Roxanne, she lost her life. And Lawrence Singleton is literally, like I have already said, one of the purest forms of evil I've ever come across. I think it's also important to say right here that I don't think that Mary Vinson was Lawrence Singleton's first victim. Investigators actually did look into some cold cases and some murders of sex workers that happened around the same time and area. And they tried to link Lawrence to these murders to see if he had done them, but they didn't have enough evidence to prove that he did. But I think if we just think about it, he was in his 50s when he attacked Mary. That is so old to start committing crime. The crimes that he committed, they were very sexually violent. You don't just wake up one day and commit crime like that. Given his job as well, he traveled a lot, which is unfortunately the perfect cover, but that is just speculation. There is no evidence to prove that, but yeah, that is just my thoughts and theories. But let me know all of your thoughts, theories, and opinions down below. I really want to hear them. And also let me know all of your case suggestions because I always want to know what you want to hear next. And this case, Mary Vincent was actually a requested case. So I do read all of your requests and I do make a note of them. So let me know in the comments down below. Thank you again to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video and I'll see you all in my next one. Bye.